Welcome everybody. My name is Michelle Witt. I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of Mini Center. My pronouns are she, her. I have light skin and dark brown hair. I'm wearing eyeglasses and a gold jacket and I'm sitting in my office at home. And I'm joined uh, by uh, some very important artists, uh, pianist Angela Hewitt, uh, choreographer Mark Morris, and the musical director of the Mark Morris Dance Group, Colin Fowler. Welcome and thank you all for your willingness to share this time together uh, in our first combined creative process conversation. And I wondered if you could each introduce yourselves. Uh, hello, I'm Angela Hewitt, a classical pianist. I'm here in my home in London, England, although I'm Canadian. Uh, and uh, I have uh, a white skin. Uh, I still have long uh, brown hair despite my age of 62. Um, I'm uh, in an old gray sweater because I had my vaccine against COVID three hours ago and I needed to wear something they could uh, get the jab into easily. And I've got on a, an Italian scarf and you can see in the background my electronic keyboard and then behind me my Fazioli concert grand piano. There we are. Great to be here. Thank you. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, I will. I am Mark Morris. I'm a choreographer and I run my company, which is the Mark Morris Dance Group for 40 years. This year is the 40th, that's a lot of years, year. Um, I am visible only from the shoulders up in sort of a bust, which is perfect because I look like Poseidon. I have gray thinning, but too longish hair, a full white beard, I'm wearing cheap magnifying glasses that I order online four pairs at a time for like $20. I'm sitting in front of my vast library flash kitchen in my apartment in Manhattan. I am, if you're listening closely, you can tell that I'm queer, I'm male and I'm American. And other than that, I, I can't help much. Thanks, Mark. And oh, I'm gorgeous. I forgot to tell you I'm gorgeous. gorgeous. <laughs> Very yeah. true. Colin? <laughs> Uh, my name is Colin Fowler. I am the music director for the Mark Morris Dance Group. I am a light-skinned male. My pronouns are he and him. I have brown hair with some white and gray specks. I have a closely trimmed, unposeidon-like beard, which is gray with also some white flecks. I'm wearing a white and blue button-down, and I'm in my bedroom. And I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Thank you uh, for your willingness to share this time together um, in our first combined creative process discussion where we bring artists together um, and uh, that are performing uh, separately on, on the season. And today's discussion is centered around Mozart, music, and movement. Um, but I'd also like to add the phrase and more as I hope that we will touch on other topics in our time together. Um, but let's begin with Mozart. Uh, Mini will be presenting Mark Morris Dance Group's Mozart Dances this month, which is uh, just extraordinary. The brilliant choreography is set to music written by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and his piano concerto, Number 11, the Sonata in D major for two pianos and his piano concerto number 27. And this month we're also presenting Angela Hewitt. One of, of course, Angela, you're one of the greatest interpreters of Mozart's piano repertoire. Uh, although your work um, on the Mini Center, Mini on Screen will be an all Bach program. So I'd like to hear Angela from you first. Um, you play all of the Mozart concerti and incorporate this work into your performances. What is it about this music that's so compelling to you? It was composed in the late 1700s and here we're gathered over, to Zoom, over Zoom to talk about this. Um, where does it take you and how do you approach it? Well, the Mozart Piano Concertos, I think it's one of the, the greatest sort of uh, collection of works for, for the keyboard. Uh, other than the Bach uh, keyboard concertos, especially something like the Fifth Brandenburg Concerto, which has a big keyboard part with a big cadenza and, mm -hmm. and his D minor concerto. These are really the first, uh, first wonderful concertos of, of the classical period. Haydn wrote two, but the Mozart are on a different scale. And also where the piano, the piano is... Uh, such a such a dramatic force in the action and the dialogue with the orchestra is so important mm -hmm. so they're very um theatrical 
theatrical pieces, mm -hmm. I, I find. Uh, every theme has a character. Mm -hmm. um, the pianist has to play many different characters. Um, but it, it's, it's uh, on, a, on a purely technical uh, uh, plane, you have to have you know, a beautiful sound, you have to be able to imitate the human voice all the time, not just in the slow passages, but also in very runny passages, you know, mm -hmm. ah, you have to be able to do that on the piano as well. Um, and, and then, as I say, be part of the action, be part of the dialogue. So I, I love them because I like anything that's theatrical and, and dramatic and, uh, but, but um, they're, they're, they go from really very early on in his life. I mean, he wrote his first great concerto, the number nine, the K271, uh, he wrote when he was just 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And it's really the piece where Mozart became Mozart. Uh, it, it's, it's an incredible work with a very dramatic and moving slow movement. It, it's, it, it's uh, you know, impossible to imagine that a 20 year old wrote that. Mm -hmm. And then the number 27, which Mark is using in his ballet, the final one, where, although of course he didn't know he was going to die, but there's a there's in, in the happy tune of the last movement, dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, there is uh, such melancholy. I get the shivers mm. even just singing that, that little bit. Such melancholy and um, and 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 a little bit sense of, of of regret, even though he's talking about the spring coming because it comes from a song. I'm covering a lot of ground here, and I, but anyway, those are just a few thoughts. But but they do, uh, you know, he wrote them for himself to play. Of course, he wrote them for his subscription concerts in Vienna. Most of them, the ones in the at least in the in the middle there um, to, to make his name you know he would put on the concerts himself he would pay for the musicians and everything and then you know make money hopefully out of it in the end um, but uh, but uh, and then towards the end of of his life when his fame was a bit not his fame but his popularity was a bit on the wane and and um, so one gets the sense of the, mu the music changes as well there. But in, in any case, they are extraordinary pieces to play for their dramatic content, as well as the sheer um, thrill that you get out of physically playing this music. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and Mark, uh, of course, you chose to focus on these three Mozart pieces. Um, wh why these 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 works? And uh, oh, let's start with that. Yeah. Well, why? Well, I'm sorry, but Angela covered everything. <laughs> That's a I'm done. I'm done. Thank you so much. That'll be all, everybody. No, what she <laughs> said. It's like uh, what Americans have started saying for some reason. Spot on. That used to be only English people said. Now we're saying this. I don't get it. Um, but it's that's true. I agree. What happened was I um, I was commissioned to make up a piece for Mozart's whatever if, uh, you know anniversary of his death or whatever mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Peter Sellers put on a a, a festival in Vienna uh, called uh, New Crown Hope, which was mm -hmm. the name of the Masonic temple to which Mozart belonged. Especially mm -hmm. in the last years of, of his life, he was writing Masonic music. Basically, mm -hmm. that springtime tune is springtime for for mankind for humankind um and so peter's idea was to uh to pay homage to mozart without playing any mozart so his his idea was the themes of music from the last part of last really the year last year of mozart's life uh magic flute uh uh this concerto number 27 um a bunch of music that then he invited are international artists to apply their techniques to this. So fabulously, you know, the, the Cambodian ballet was commissioned to do a, a, a version of something of Mozart with no Mozart music. John, John Adams wrote a little, a small sort of cantata called The Flowering Tree. And I choreographed these three pieces of Mozart. So I insisted on doing Mozart. Peter wanted zero Mozart in the whole thing, although he, he, uh, he debuted a staging of Mozart's very early like baby opera, Zaida, that nobody ever does. And uh, I insist on doing, it's like, if we're doing Mozart, I'm doing Mozart, forget, or, or I'm not coming. I'm, I'll mm -hmm. take my ball and go home. 
So anyway, I was thinking of using three big concertos of different solo instruments. I was thinking of horn or clarinet or piano, maybe, or whatever, some strings. Anyway, so I had also met, this is a long story, but so what? Okay, so um, I had a, a little while before that met a hero of mine, darling Emmanuel Axe, pianist. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, he wanted to work with me and he'd seen my piece to the, the Schumann Piano Quintet and liked it a lot. And so I thought, well, wait a minute, why don't I just do damn piano for all of it? Because I love these pieces. Mm -hmm. And so the story was I was gonna do three piano concertos and I kept listening to the double concerto, the, the concerto for two pianos. And I liked it so much that I kept playing for people who were listening, but listen to this first, which is the slow movement from the sonata for two pianos, which is the most devastating, gorgeous piece of music imaginable. It's like Bach wished he wrote that. <laughs> so that piece is like, okay, listen to this, but first listen to this. So I ended up inviting Manny and his partner and spouse, uh, Yoko Axe, to play the two piano parts. Um, and it premiered in Vienna. Um, and so it's these three pieces I call, because I can never remember Kuchel numbers or keys or keys or anything. So that's why I call it, it's called 11, double mm -hmm. and 27 are the name of the dances as, so I can remember what they are. And uh, so it's this evening, which the center of which of these nine sections, three for each concerto, uh, for each piece, the middle section is the slow, the slow movement of the sonata. So that's sort of like the, the gravitational center and everything opens up uh, beyond that choreographically, musically, imaginatively. But I, I did wanna say that the Mozart thing for me that Angela knocked out of my brain uh, is that <clears throat> I came late to Mozart. I didn't think I liked it. I thought it was like classical music and it all sounded the same, <clears throat> which by the way is true. All Handel operas are identical and they're all masterpieces. So, you know, I listened to the Carter family, uh, you know, American uh, hillbilly music, as it was called then, uh, Ozark music, that's all in the same key, the same four chords maximum. And I used to listen to Mozart <laughs> as cod liver oil. It was good for me. And then I went insane from the opera. So when I was like, I don't know, 1820, the operas grabbed me in a way that nothing ever has. And that was the secret key to the concertos. So mm -hmm. I agree with Andrew. It's like, wait a minute, who is this amazing character who just made an entrance from somewhere in the orchestra? And the answer is the piano. Where did that come from? And so there's these fabulous characters and mysteries within all of this music that I'm just there to sort of plumb and uh, expand a little bit. So it's vis more visual and audio visual instead of just audio. Mm -hmm. And uh, the central movement of that, of that uh, piano sonata, the way in which you choreograph it, it's so powerful. It just, even when I'm watching it on a, you know, on an iPad, um, which is the last time I saw it, it just jumps out. I mean, it's just so, so moving, beautiful. Um, Colin, as music director, um, are there special challenges um, or delights when you're leading from the podium? Um, uh, this, this conversation between musicians and the dancers, sort of how do you, how do you navigate that? Um, I mean, that's, that's one of the best parts of my job actually is, uh, is to collaborate with them. Um, to be a dancer in Mark's company, definitely well granted I don't have a lot of experience working with other dance companies but definitely working with the dancers in the Mark Morris dance group um, you have to have a certain musicality a certain mm -hmm. rhythm um, and mm -hmm. a certain understanding and appreciation of the music to fully bring Mark's work to light in my mm -hmm. opinion um, and so getting to work with them um, to bring Mark's piece and Mozart's beautiful music to life um, is is probably the best part of my job not just Mozart, but in this particular instance. Um, I actually have an interesting relationship with this piece because this is the first piece that I ever worked and collaborated with Mark on. Um, I, I actually, I think Mark, it was the, I think it was the 250th anniversary. Oh, have we lost birth, Colin? But I'm not sure, because it was around Dallas. Oh, there you're back. Go back to you um, think it was the 250th, oh, we lost that. Just restart I believe it was. Sentence. I believe it was the 200, sorry, restarting. I believe it was the 250th anniversary of his birth, 1756, because I think it premiered in around 2006, but I, I don't know, it was a while ago. Anyway, that was the first thing that I got to collaborate with Mark on, and I played for the rehearsals for it, which uh, was really fun to do because I got to play the 
orchestral reduction and the sonata as Mark was creating the work. And so getting to see the piece literally be created in the room, um, sort of, I don't know, it was very enlightening for me to watch the process and how the music affected what Mark was doing and seeing the dancers embody that, and then to get to perform it and to get to conduct it, um, and just to bring all of the things together to make it the beautiful piece that it is, is, uh, is really wonderful. So as far as challenges, you mentioned, no, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say nota bene. Colin was also working on uh, an arrangement for uh, a chamber arrangement of the of concerto number 27, because Mozart wrote a, a reduced version of it's what it's piano quintet for number 11 or something, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think. Right. Yes. So it's been reduced from a full orchestra. And for us, frankly, to be able to tour it a lot of places, we would do the first two pieces, 11 in a smaller arrangement and then the double, but we couldn't do 27. We would do a different piece on that program, but it's meant to be a triptych. And so Colin was sort of in the process of making a, a reduced arrangement based on Mozart's arrangement of 11, if that makes any sense. So we could do it in a suitcase mm -hmm. size instead mm -hmm. of a you know cargo mm -hmm. ship or something. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Colin. No, I believe, I think it's 11, 12, and 13, his three piano okay. concerti that he wrote, which can be done with a chamber version, I believe. Yeah. But um, yeah. anyway, uh, Michelle, you were asking about the challenges other yeah. than dealing with Mark. Um, kidding, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, Mark, kidding. Um, uh, there are there are definitely some challenges. Um, just some music gets gets complicated and and, and getting and sometimes Mark Mark's choreography is very complicated. Um, and also challenging working with some musicians, making sure that they have a collaborative feeling to work with Mark and the dancers and if I'm conducting or whatnot, so that we go, we can all be on the same page um, to make the work as beautiful as it can be. Mm -hmm. And the musicality of the dancers is also just extraordinary. Um, they really do embody the, embody the music. Uh, and I'm really inspired by this interdependence between music and dance. Uh, uh, and, and Angela, there's a very dancerly quality to, to your playing your movements and your phrasing. And, and where does that come from? Is that something innate um, or that something that you've worked to, to cultivate? No, 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 I started piano and ballet at the same time at the age of three. Uh, and I adored classical ballet. I did it very seriously for 20 years. And our teacher in Ottawa, where I grew up in Canada, had danced with the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo in the American troupe. Nesta Tumin, her husband was Russian, Slava Tumin, he had done their costumes and, and she knew all the original choreography from, you know, from memory of, of Nutcracker and Les Sylphides and Coppelia and the Polovitsian dances, Borodine, and we, we put them all on and we, you know, we were a semi-professional group, but, but, but we did a decent job. And in fact, many of the kids in my class went on, well, one now runs the Royal Winnipeg Ballet and another was the soloist in the National Ballet in Canada for many years. So, um, it, it was it was a really, really large part of my upbringing. And I'm so happy that I had that. I also did Scottish dancing too. Yeah. I've been dancing just for fun because my mom's family was Scottish. But um, but I, I loved it. And I was always prancing around my bedroom. I'd put on an LP, you know, oh, it's a box Brandenburg Concertos or whatever, Ravel, and off I would go, you know, and and move all the furniture out of the way. So I had room. And so for me, uh, music and dance go completely together. You can't separate these, it's impossible. I mean, uh, you know, the caveman, even before he had an instrument, probably he was singing and dancing. So uh, all of music is, is dance and, and music is gesture and, and, and Bach broke music is all gesture and dance. 95% of Bach, if not 100% is it's dance music, even in the, even in sacred pieces like the, B minor mass or the St. Matthew Passion, it's full of dance rhythms. So uh, Beethoven, Beethoven is full of the dance, Ravel, you know, just anything that gives you uh, this sense of motion and, and, you know, into the floor and up, 
up into the air and never having every beat the same, which is deadly in musical interpretation, you know. It's not one, two, three, it's one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's the basis of everything I do at the, at the, at the keyboard. And, and um, I'm so thankful for that, actually, that I had that training. Also, it gives you incredible discipline, you know. <laughs> my teacher went around with a stick. <laughs> and, um, and I think a lot of my discipline comes from my ballet days and stamina, you know, if you can do 32, what taste on point you can you can get through pretty, pretty well anything and so I think a lot of that comes from from my dance training mm, thank you also yeah also I may say it's just it's this feeling of center of which of course Mark can explain better than me but it's you know it's what you've got right here no and 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 when you walk on stage to perform that's what holds you together and 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 you know, there's something about knowing how to present yourself and feeling this strength, this inner strength right in you physically that helps you so much in performance. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we, we all just sat up straighter when you said that. It's like, there's something where everybody goes like, <laughs> it's like, oh, that's right. I've been Zooming for a while this year. You know, I'm thinking and thinking. Anyway, I've I don't have much going on below what you can see, believe me. I, you know, do what I can. But what you said about clearing out the furniture, that's what every dancer in the world is doing right now. And yeah. it, we're tired of it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. and also I, I did an interview recently with a, a friend of mine um, who's a, a classical Indian dancer. And I know her very well from India. And I was saying what I miss, this is related, but when I go outside, when I first went outside during this plague period, I, I would make, it made me cry just because there were other people and the flowers and the birds and the, no you know, no traffic. It was heaven for a while, but I couldn't take the 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 overwhelming sort of senses, and that's what's missing. So when I was talking here, it's like, well, you know, I wasn't just missing India because I said I've used when I've seen you dance in India, I've seen her dance all over the world. Seen her dance in India. There's also the temperature and the humidity and the incense and the floral, the flowers and the people around you and the music and people, you hear them breathing, you hear footfalls on the floor, um, which of course in a film you add post-production. So it's like, I realized I was missing a whole bunch of senses that I count on all the time. And it was talking to her, I got sort of choked up because I realized that's true when I'm rehearsing or teaching on Zoom. It's like, wait, I, why aren't you, you're, you're so lazy. Why don't you work hard? It's like, oh, I can't tell that you're like panting out of breath because you're in a, you know, it's like, it's so confusing. So one of the senses besides uh, sight and sound in the case of music and dance is everything else. The space around you, your, pro, you know, uh, your proprio-centric feelings of how much space you occupy, breath, which has now become so dangerous. That's, what's, that's what we're missing, the living kinesthetic aspect of it. And there's nothing we can do about it. We simulate it this way and we've learned how to do that. But boy, do I miss that. That's mm -hmm. all. I just wanted to stick that in because I'm tired of Zooming everybody. But mm -hmm. here we are. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Um, Mark, you're, you're so renowned for your knowledge of music and exploration of music through dance. And uh, would you speak a little bit about, uh, about this kinetic, the visual, the musical, how they coming together for you and a little bit about uh, even perhaps the beginnings of that for you? Oh boy. I think the beginnings of that are like the first, you open your eyes and start screaming and mm -hmm. somebody spanks you. And I'm talking about birth. I'm not just talking about a difficult relationship. Um, so I think that it's, everybody's always using all the senses they've got and some are developed better than others. You know, it's like, you know, some, well, God knows the COVID thing with smell and taste that scares me. I, I keep smelling stuff to be sure I'm doing okay. Um, but I, you know, also Angela nailed it when she said uh, ab about dancing and music being inseparable, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I've not, I've never looked for music let's say I've never thought up a dance and then found music to it, except very, very rarely if I'm doing a particularly, you know, an, in a narrative or something. But to me, uh, you know, walking, it, it goes back, goes down to rhythm. It goes back to repetition, walking, breathing, talking, doing chores, you know, anything that needs a little bit of labor 
people are singing with that, putting a baby to sleep. If a, but if I'm, I'm sorry, but if a lullaby isn't a steady beat, uh, she wakes right up again, and starts screaming. That's what that's what I would do. It has mm -hmm. to be the tempo to lull you to sleep. That's the whole mm -hmm. point. So if it's working, everyone is nodding off right now at home. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's the excitement of where's the next beat really? Where's mm -hmm. it going to happen? Your yeah right. The your footfalls. When does your weight shift? What's how is it different? facing this way or facing another way away from the the viewer or dancers uh, you know the relationships of one to the to the other I've always choreographed for proscenium space for stages for that you look at something and see it in the golden mean of the rectangle and you're watching it and they're doing it I really like that I don't like a free-for-all improv kind of thing so what the audience is alive the band the musicians, the singers, whatever players are alive, and the dancers are alive in depth mm. and the space in which, you, have, you know, it's like when you hear an organ, anybody hear an organist? We have an organist in the crowd. The thing that, oh, Colin, Colin, <laughs> organist, yeah. Juilliard, I heard, I heard. Okay, but but that's the thing. I, I have a, a, a good friend of mine, we went to hear a piece that had a big, uh, big organ part, a Lou Harrison piece we heard at Trinity, a friend of mine. And it's, you know, organs sound best in a place that can accommodate them let's say like a church or something like that mm -hmm. and you know it doesn't work on headphones so well and he went to this concert um and we came out and i you know it's like something why does it why does it move me like that and he said it was like the sound was the exact same shape as the interior of the room we were in mm -hmm. you know it's like you fill it with aspic and that's the, that's the shape mm -hmm. of the sound is the shape of the room and i love that and it reminded me that I feel that way all the time. The thing that's happening mm -hmm. here and with you and between all of us, whether we know it or not, is the real, the communication part, the communal part of music and dancing and the, you know, the performing arts, the lyric art in general, I would say. End of sentence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Colin, um, you, would you share how you approach uh, the performance of Mozart in the context of dance? Um, you know, some of Mozart is originally, of course, as we've been talking about, originally written as a dance, dance form. Do you take the lead from dancers? Are you guiding the dance through this music? Um, um, I think as Angela said beautifully earlier, you know, so much of Mozart's music is, is dance. Well, I'm pointing to her, but I'm sure she's different on your screen, but she's right there. Um, <laughs> but some much of Mozart's music is dance. It's um, it's often buoyant and, and lively and is filled with air. Um, and as also she sang for us, you know, it has so many singing lines that that, that you can embody physically. Uh, um, and, and as far as working with the dancers specifically, I it really is a communal effort. It's a collaborative effort. They follow the musician's lead or the orchestra's lead or the pianist's lead. Um, sometimes we take things from them. Sometimes they take things from us and um, Mark always insists on live music which is for the most part played by humans and thus it's going to be different every time um, and Mark encourages that it does need to be the same every time cadenzas are supposed to be improvisatory within reason of course but um, it, it is different every time and and the dancers thrive on that because it also keeps them I think more present as they're listening they're not going to, you can never do anything by rote because again with humans anything can happen the tempi can be a little bit different even the phrasing can be a little different Mm -hmm. um, even in the first movement of 11, there's a, there's a big solo done by Lauren Grant, and she does a big move, um, which is often a loud chord, and sometimes when I'm playing it, I'll do a lighter chord and just almost whisper it, and, you know, she'll react, and it's, that's just one tiny little example of it's different every time, and they take some things from us, we take some things from them, and that's really the beauty is that it's a true collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Period. I'd like to um, add, add a, a, a sub question in here, or it's really more than a sub question, which is, of course, Mozart's music tends toward precision and stylistic elegance. And in, in Mark, in, in your choreograph choreographic setting of, of Mozart's uh, music, there's also a, as you mentioned, Angela, the centeredness, but there's also a connection to the ground, this sort of um, weightiness or um, uh, uh, almost an angularity at, at, at points, of course. Um, uh, could you say a little bit about that? About oh, I would stop you right when you said precision and elegance and say I completely <laughs> agree with that. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I do. 
Yeah. That's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's a it, thank you. Um, and and the concept of theme and variations, of course, is so important in in Mozart's music. Um, Mark, you know, of course, you you are constantly approaching theme and variation in different ways. Um, you think about making visible what the audience is hearing through through movement. Um, do you consider yourself helping the audience to hear the music, or is it more of um, something much more? Um, I think I've answered my own question, actually. I don't like that question. <laughs> or not. Can I just yeah, or that not. Question? Yeah, sure, of course. You can do it again, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to ask it, but if you don't like the question, don't just well, don't did answer I throw it. You with, so, did I throw you with precision and elegance? No, you didn't. I just don't. Oh, okay. I, I'm realizing I don't love this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Oh, so, okay. Um, okay. So, so uh, Mark, how do you approach theme and variation in dance? Um, how do you make visible what the audience is hearing through movement? And how are you helping the audience to hear the music? Okay, well, first of all, try as I might, I can't make an audience think anything. There's <laughs> nothing you can do. They're on their own, and the ones who are paying attention may get more out of the experience than people who aren't, but I don't get to decide that, you know? Um, you know, it's like if the, there's a snowflake falling from last year's Christmas pageant, that's all anybody's going to watch. You're doing the most beautiful piece of music, the most beautiful dance in the world. Something falls from the wings. It's like, oh no. And everybody's like, oh, what is, you know, you just watch it. That <laughs> happens all the time. It's like, oh my God, the soprano was flat in one of the 7,000 notes <laughs> in this particular Rossini aria. It's like we will never recover from that. And that's because of recordings. I'm sure of that, but that made us all think we have perfect pitch and don't hear the room unless deciding how much ambient sound they're going to put on the record. See, I'm back to live performance again. It always takes me there. Um, but I don't decide what an audience will think. It's none of my business. They think enough to come back. So I'm successful in that way. But I'm also, I go from music, I believe, the same way that uh, a performing musician does. And so it's not, I'm not just analyzing it and deciding, you know, it's also, the wonderful skill of animating uh, music by dancing or by film or by drawing or by especially the great work of Walt Disney Studios, so that the people who are called Imagineers, who taught a lot of us, you know, or Warner Brothers, the first classical music a lot of people know is thanks to Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. And I mean it, you know, it's like, what's opera doc is one of the great introductions to opera. It's like, oh, it's fun and wonderful and surprising and it's for everybody. That's what led me in. So, but I think that's what you mean, like something that's clumsy, doesn't seem to go with, uh, with 18th century protocol or, or behavior where you put on rough sleeves and, and wigs. It's like, that's not why this music is interesting. It's not because of its antiquity. It's lasted because people like it. And it's always new. The early music movement, you know, as long lived as it was, it's still, there's still remnants of it, but it's influenced everybody. It's like, oh, I guess you could do it like that. Or wait, that used to sound out, out of tune to me, that forte piano, but I now love it. You know, it's like, there's so many different possibilities. And that's true of deciding to make up a dance that happens at the same time as the music. In my case, I do it with the music on purpose. And if it seems illustrative or reductive, I'm sorry, that sounds like running to me, so run. You know, it's very direct. And it's also, I'm dealing with text in the case of opera or songs, or I make them up. I use the text of that last springtime song in 27, last moon of that, from the words that helped me decide the choreography, even though no one's singing the words at that point. If you know, mm -hmm. probably Angela is in her head while she's playing. It's like, oh, let's see, I love springtime, you know. So, <laughs> but that's not what we're hearing. It's what we're sensing. And so that sight and sound and proximity and everything that can happen and it's live and you decide what thing you want to watch and to a certain extent what you want to listen to that's what I say about that so it's not I'm not a solution to anybody I'm not healing anybody I don't think that the arts are automatically a balm to save us from our saddest moments I think that they can provoke our saddest moments and I think that that's a really important range of art that isn't just I feel bad let me play let me play a sad emo song on my guitar where I know three chords, I'm working on the fourth one. 
you can cut that out if you want. That's a little Seattle. That's a little grungy there. I was just going through that. <laughs> um, and Angela, um, this is a, a final question for you about about Mozart and playing Mozart, which is um, when you're when you're playing Mozart um, and you're you're bringing all of your senses to the music making. Um, are you uh, are you what are you imagining visually or or um, how are you feeling your body? Do you feel that that dance, that dancing body from uh, from your youth? Uh, or are you just intuitively moving through the music? It's interesting, oh. actually, at the moment, one of my pandemic projects in the last few months has been uh, I, I'm working on all the Mozart sonatas, the keyboard, the, just the piano sonatas. Uh, solo sonatas, of course, many I've played already, but but some some of them I've I've never played, and some actually uh, some of the early ones, which are usually considered not very good because you know he got better later on, but actually they're fabulous pieces. But what what I see in those, uh, first of all, is that you have to play every note as though you're the greatest singer on earth. Uh, you know, some of the slow movements can seem rather naive and simple and so and sort of, well, so what? But if you then if you play them like really, you know, the great in Chopin's day, it was a singer called La Pasta, <laughs> you know, sing it like Callas or whatever, uh, then it, it becomes another piece entirely. Mm -hmm. And and also you can never pay enough attention to beautiful articulation and phrasing and the touch and the variety of touch you use. Every phrase has to come alive, uh, even in something very simple. So tempo makes a big difference. You know, you have to play these pieces with, with great energy. You can't just sort of pl play them. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not enough. You've got to put in incredible energy into what seems like the, you know, the simplest music really. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it takes a, a lot of, uh, a lot of work. I mean, I've been working on Mozart all my life. So, okay, I, I basically know how I want to play him, but, but I am surprised at the difference you can make when you really uh, put everything you have into these pieces. And so, I mean, the feeling for the dance, that just comes to me naturally now. I don't have to think about it, I guess. Although in some of these sonatas, for instance, there's one movement that's a polonaise, one slow movement is a polonaise. I used to dance the polonaise in, in Onegin, you know, our teacher did the, that wonderful polonaise. So I know the tempo of a polonaise because most pianists play Chopin polonaise. It's far too fast. You could mm -hmm. never dance them at that speed. Um, and, um, uh, for instance, I also just played in Hanover, I just made a film of the Concerto 25, the C major, and the last movement of that, uh, Mozart took from his early uh, dance music for um, Idomeneo, the opera, and the, la and the theme of the last movement of the concerto is, was a gavotte in that ballet music. <clears throat> so you can know to play it at that speed, whereas a lot of pianists, again, don't think of that, and they race through this thing, which is at it. It's only marked Allegretto, which isn't that fast, actually, in Mozart. Um, and that's another thing I see. His tempo markings are actually very indicative of the speed he wants. And when you know his whole opus, all his concertos and all his sonatas, you see that an andante is not that slow. An Allegretto is not that fast. When he makes the difference between andante and adagio, he really means it. The adagio is definitely slower. Um, you know, there's a difference between uh, Allegro and Presto. It's it's interesting. And then it's also, sorry, I'm very enthusiastic because I am really just working on, on seven Mozart sonatas at, this, at the moment. Um, also, you see in some of those early sonatas germs of the slow movements of his great concertos. Yeah. Um, you know, where he's used the same type of theme, the same time signature, something similar. Uh, and, and that's quite exciting, actually, to yeah. to. But but uh, I I think there's you know it's it's music that's so fresh and that when I you know on these horrible days where we're all stuck inside where we can't have our lives as we normally have them I I live alone so I basically spend all my time alone here but when I sit down and play Mozart I start my day with playing a sonata I enter another world. I enter another world and for several hours I'm happy you know and um, it's the most wonderful feeling. Thank you, and uh, and I, I just wanted to share when I when I see the the Mark Morris dancers when I see your dancers uh, with this, this repertoire, I really feel that energy and the articulation and the the the, the delicacy and the 
the attention to the gesture and it's just it's really thrilling um and and of course it has been quite a year uh, for all of us uh but and uh but for each of you 2020 has had more than its fair share of highs and lows and i just wonder if you could could share perhaps a moment of sort of something wonderful from this year and of course if there's there tremendous difficulties with with dance companies and with touring and and all of that but if you could just share a moment or two of your experiences this year whatever you want to share. I want to I want to say something that isn't exactly that that's but fine it relates of course to what Angela obviously Angela you should just do this on your own you don't need us at all you're so articulate so you fabulous it's true. plus I agree with you which makes you right also you're not just great you're right because I agree with you but one of that is that you, Michelle, used a reversible term. You talked about her dancerly playing and our musicianly choreography or some music, you know, a musical, hmm. my dancers are so That's musical. That's true, I did. And a musician is so dancerly. Musical in the 18th century was secret and up through the 20th century was secret code for queer, for gay. Like men, hmm. you know, I'm musical, which means hmm. I'm gay. Hmm. I am, by the way, I have no problem with that. Well, I do have a little problem. I'm alone. And there's, you know, but um, the thing is, I'm not sure how to define that. People say, you know, your work or your music, your dancers are so musical or you're so musical. And I agree, but I'm, I'm hard pressed to say what that is. And I think the same thing with dance, like it doesn't mean your aunt, you know, Yo-Yo Ma dances in his chair more than most people do standing up. You know, when he plays, that's what he does, whether it's, you know, he's so into it, or it's just his mode is, or an affectation, or the deepest thing in the world. We don't know, but it works, and it's action, and music makes people want to move if it's engaging. That's why I don't, very little music was written to see how boring it could be, including a lullaby. It's meant to calm you down, put you to sleep, but, you know, the repeats in older music that contemporary Western people sometimes reject, mm -hmm. it's because it has to happen again. And it's different the next time, or when it comes that's back, very, it's developed. Very, or yeah, that's very true. And it's interesting. You sorry to interrupt, Mark, but it's interesting no, you right. that because in some of these early sonatas I've been doing, I've been listening to the rec recordings, you know, of famous people, and and they leave out a lot of the repeats. Mm. And I'm no, I want to hear that again. I want to play it again. It's it's exciting, you know. So it's interesting you right. said that. And it's different the second time, uh, whether it's, Absolutely. you know, minute, many minutes later in a da capo aria in a Handel opera or mm -hmm. eight bars later, like uh, the Brahms waltzes I'm working on right now. It's like, wait, we just did that. Of course, that's why we get to do it again. It's mm -hmm. circular. It's, it's wonderful. So it, it makes you want more, not less. I think that's part of what's engaging, what makes it musical or dancerly is that it's it's vivid it's alive mm -hmm. and it's breathe like we all just sat up again but it's it's a physical thing you know mm -hmm. it's a physical not just an intellectual thing if you hear Bach as math you're right and if you hear Bach as the gateway to Elysium you're also right you know mm -hmm. and he was bright enough to be able to do all of those things and I can just do it with my hand so I'm done with that I've had a horrible year Michelle it's so hard I am Try, I tried my best for a long time to keep cheerleading and keep my company and the people I come in contact with like this going. And then I realized that I was running on fumes myself. Mm -hmm. and it's been very, very hard. And it's for everybody. Um, and I started by sleeping about 12 or 14 hours a day for a month or so. Mm -hmm. I cooked. I was, I'm a really good cook. I cooked mm -hmm. for a few months and I stopped. I hated all, everything. I've been doing like a love, like, hate dislike kind of range it doesn't get very ecstatic i can't read for some reason mm. music i can do i've been doing these video projects and teaching we're doing what we can to keep a little ember you know glowing to come back we hope to some form of performing in theaters and realize it's never going to be the same it's it never has been from one minute to the next isn't the same and i'm not a real devout buddhist but i look at the you know i'm not I'm here right now. Let's just say be here now. And I'm doing that. And it's still annoying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, that's that was the good part, too. Anyway, that's mm -hmm. my report on the plague year. Mm -hmm. and shall I go? Yeah, shall I go? 
<laughs> you, you, you've already shared a bit, and if you, but I would love to hear a little bit more. Yeah. Well, just very, very briefly, when when the pandemic started in March of last year, I I found it hard to listen to music at first. I mm -hmm. the only thing I could listen to was Cupra. I love, you know, Cupra somehow just shows this perfect world where everything is orderly and 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 yet expressive. But so and and then I you know, started playing, but I, I mean, I was months at home without anything. And then in the fall, I did some filmed performances. I managed to travel to Canada after doing my quarantine. Quarantine, I know it's necessary, but I just, you know, to be locked in a room for two weeks is just uh, terrible for you. Uh, but I did some filming in Canada and I did some filming in Germany. And that was my most important thing is that I went to Leipzig to play the Goldberg Variations in the Thomas Kirche where Bach lies in the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was perhaps one of the most moving uh, days of my life to, to film that there. So I, I'm just so happy that, that we were able to 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 do that uh, even though it was months late but now actually 2021 is looking worse than 2020 because now everything is stopped again um the travel i'm i'm stuck here in london and we really can't go anywhere uh and so 2021 is looking even more uh, even worse for me than 2020 um but we just have have to keep going and i i have lots of projects that i've created myself to to keep me going um but it's it's very hard mm -hmm. and it is it is such a, a a reminder of how important the live performance experience is i think we're all just grieving continuing to grieve the loss of of that experience together Yes. And we're certainly um, eager to 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 get live performance back on the mini stage as soon as we possibly can. I think that's what the Ember Mark was talking about, in that you know we can do whatever we can through this medium, which is better than nothing. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, mm -hmm. the thing that I other yeah, it's, it's unable to be replicated whether you're on stage or in the audience. I mean, I miss going to shows too, but uh, most mm -hmm. importantly, I miss performing. I, you, you just cannot replicate that. Um, I mean, Angela, I'm sure even performing for a video is still performing, but you, 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 that, that, that feeling inside that you feel, whether there's 50 people or 5,000 people right. in the room experiencing it in that moment um, is just, we just can't have that right now. And that, that is a, just a real, it's just, it's very hard. It's a real bummer. <laughs> Yeah, and jokes yeah. don't go I, over very big either. I'll tell you, jokes are difficult, and I like jokes, so sorry if I'm not getting any big laughs. <laughs> yeah, well, I have like five words I was gonna say. It's it's a real, it's like bummer. It's hardship, shit show. There, I, there's so many. I don't know, but it's it's not good. It's not good. I would say on the the only one bright side um, is that in we've had a little more time to ourselves um, and in being and trying to be creative to do something to be that we can do um uh it's been fun to learn some new skills i practiced some pieces that i've been meaning to learn forever actually ironically the goldberg variations i've never actually learned them and so i've been practicing them and learning them and i love them of course always mm -hmm. have um i've taught myself how to video edit sort of and so mark and i have gotten to work together in that medium um which has been really fun i'd much rather be performing but it's nice to learn Mm -hmm. Learn a new mm -hmm. skill, and, and I found a new way to collaborate um, and make creative work with Mark, which has been fun. Colin tuned his own pianos. Wow. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yes. Well done. He bought the tools, I guess, online. How to tune your piano? It worked. It doesn't last a long time. In fact, you better get back to it. But. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I had a little time on my hands, unlike everybody else, you know. So. Good. So, uh, so during the pandemic, my husband's uh, he started woodworking. Our entire garage is all, you know, it's 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 everything else is out of there, and it's all woodworking. I've I've been met, learning to meditate seriously, um, which has been actually probably the most important discovery that I've made during the pandemic. Uh, but Great. are there are there uh, other than what you've already said, any any new projects or pastimes that you've you've been able to engage? I know it's hard. It's hard to read. It's hard to listen to music. It's hard to do all those things that we we normally do right now. Well, the the thing about it being hard is that there is, of course, there's whatever color lining it is. It's not exactly silver, maybe sort of gray, but pale mm -hmm. gray. 
there is, I have hope. I'm also super lucky. I have a certain amount of job that I'm still doing reduced. My company is coming together gradually. We just started working a little bit, very cautiously, a few people in each subset at my studios in Brooklyn. So I had a rehearsal today with a gigantic mm. crowd of three dancers mm. in a huge studio in masks far apart, trying to talk and I'm here with a microphone and they're dancing and it kind of worked, but it's a little, it's, it's tricky and they mm -hmm. can all do it. They're so happy to be in a bigger space. They can run mm -hmm. for one second instead of hitting a wall every time they turn around. So everybody's out of breath and like <laughs> discovering what, what three dimensions, four dimensions mm -hmm. are like again. So, you know, I'm of course super lucky in that I have a work. I have some work. I don't have a kid in school that I'm trying to teach what I don't even know myself. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I live in New York, which is great. It's not very New York like and I, New York like, and I wish there were some restaurants open, but you know, mm -hmm. I'm in no hurry. I'm fine here and I'm waiting and working and hoping. Mm -hmm. And the Mark Morris Dance Center is just such an incredible uh, space, uh, both for your company and for a number of community groups that come in to, to, to be able to utilize that when they're able to in, in yeah. the future. Um, and, and Angela, any, anything else? I'm working on, a, well, I'm working on a lot of new repertoire, but, but I'm also doing a, one project that I've wanted to do for quite a while, um, I've, which sort of stems from, um, I, many years ago, I did a Bach DVD sort of uh, two and a half hour lecture of how to play Bach on the piano, or at least some ideas of how to play Bach on the piano since Bach wrote nothing in the score to guide us other than the notes. And now I'm putting together an edition of uh, some of the easier pieces of Bach with uh, indications of phrasing and articulation and fingering and just to give people amateurs and students and teachers an idea of uh, of of how to uh, how to play this music in, in with good taste <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> of course. hopefully but uh, it's something i enjoy actually and i sent a, a sample page to a friend in new york who's an amateur pianist, she's in her 80s. And, and first of all, I sent her the black blank page as Bach wrote, and she struggled with that for a while. And then I sent her with my marking said, Oh, wow. She said, <laughs> If only I'd known this, you know, so long ago. So uh -huh. that's sort of fun. And I hope that people will, you know, will appreciate that. But mm -hmm. it's fun to do, have the time to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need that. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, uh, I wonder if the two of you before we, or the three of you before we close, um, if you might like to ask any questions of one another at this, at this, uh, at this point. I mean, you're, you're... Mark, have you ever done any, uh, sorry, I have to look everything up now online, but have That's you okay. to Bach much? Have you done much to Bach? Yes. Right? I've done, I haven't done a huge amount, but yes, mm -hmm. indeed. I did the crazy... Uh, a crazy uh, piano reduction of Brandenburg one. Okay. That is great. It sounds like two sewing machines making love in a barrel. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's so strict. It's so, you know, it's like George Ann feel or something. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, the dance goes perfectly well with the orchestral version. But I did it for pianos on purpose. Colin, are you objecting to any of that? Oh, no. I I was just curious why you didn't name the dance that. Oh, two right. sewing two, machines two so making yeah, love. Yeah, could have gotten a grant. Could have gotten I don't a grant know. from that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I did. You know, I mean, I've done a lot of I've done a lot of baroque music, a lot of Handel, not a lot of Bach. I did uh, that one motet, uh, Jesu meine Freude. Jesu meine Freude which okay. I've choreographed. I've even conducted that a few times myself. Colin conducts everything. I make an occasional guest unqualified conductor visit. Good. Um, yeah, the, the Italian concerto, one of my mm -hmm. favorite pieces of Bach, because I'd spent years just as like an etude for myself, choreographing, I practiced choreographing to the two-part inventions, which, mm -hmm. you know, seem like nothing. Anybody can play that. That's not true. Oh, sounds like nothing. It sounds like everything. They're so great and so nothing. And so I would start that every 15 years or so. I would start working on these just to practice choreographing. Never turned into a piece, but it turned into the Italian concerto. Hmm. So 
from all of that sort of practice, it, it was very interesting. There's and there's more Bach. I can't remember what other Bach. Oh, the for example, the third suite for unaccompanied cello was a, a big a film project that I did um, with Yo-Yo playing his cello and my company dancing. That was a that was a long time ago, and that's a piece that we still do occasionally because, of course, that music wasn't intended. We'll have to do something together sometime. I think so, because I have to tell you, I, I think Bach was very good. He wasn't wow. bad. That's a hot take, hot take here. That's right, just, this, just in. And and Angela, uh, or, or, or I'm sorry, Mark, do you have, so I was so taken by that answer. I'm just thinking of the oh. Bach. I've been, I've been working on the Bach and accompanied um, sonatas and partitas for violin also during the pandemic. And it's, it's uh, no, he, he's, he's pretty good. It's, well, it's, it's the same thing. They weren't necessarily music. weren't necessarily played to be listened to. You know the, you know, uh, uh, Paul Casals, the mm -hmm. cellist who pl who played those first sort of in concert. Uh, it, you didn't play them. You know, they were like hand and exercises or something. And then of course it's great, great music. Or you know, it's like a, a art of fugue. It's like sort of a sarcastic primer in one sense. It's like here's something you don't even try this except it's every possibility in the world. So that's wonderful. So you're meant to be frustrated in, in playing this stuff. It's supposed to be hard for you. Mm -hmm. And it is, the simpler, the harder hard. kind of. Anyway, so yeah. I've learned nothing new <laughs> in this year, nothing new. I've lost some knowledge. I haven't gained a lot of it. Mm. And I spend a lot of time alone. I think I'm thinking, but I can't be sure. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's the sad part. <laughs> So thank you to all three of you for taking time to engage in this conversation together. I'm so heartened by the fact that this discussion wouldn't have taken place at Mini Center had we not moved to a virtual presenting model. And there are things we are learning in this time that we will take forward um, with us. And for these new opportunities, I'm grateful as I'm grateful to each of you for your art and for sharing your thoughts with all of us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you for you. having us.